Well, it's going to gradually fall into the mountains. The mountain streams are going to run it into the rivers and out. Now, I was in um, Niigata, which is on the Sea of Japan. It's on the west side of Japan. It's almost at the same height as, um, as Fukushima. But there's a mountain range that runs down the center of the, uh, of the island in between. And the rivers and streams in Niigata were, were highly contaminated. The, the sediment, the mud at the bottom of these rivers and streams, were highly contaminated with cesium that was coming out of the mountain range in between these two, um, um, these two halves of Japan, if you will. Well, what that means is that the radioactive source is now spreading out. Uh, we're not just seeing um, cesium being released from Fukushima Daiichi and the, the leaks into groundwater and the leaks directly into the ocean. But we're seeing all the rivers and streams as they come out of the mountains into the Pacific on the, on the East Coast and into the Sea of Japan on the West Coast are also carrying cesium, um, which is going to work its way up the food chain and contaminate fresh water as well as saltwater fish. Uh, Arnie, is cesium the only isotope being found in these fish? No, that's a really good point, Kevin. Um, if cesium is the easiest one to measure, uh, you can put it into a radiation detector and then uh, you'll pick it up um, quite easily. It, it emits a very distinctive um, energetic um, ray and, and you can pick it up pretty easily. But when you see uh, cesium levels as high as 11,000 um, becquerels per kilogram, what that means 11,000 disintegrations per second for every two pounds of, of meat, uh, there's also got to be strontium-90 as well. So strontium-90 is in the bones of the fish. And, um, you know, people say, well, I don't eat the bones, so I don't have to worry about the strontium-90. But the Japanese make stew with fish, and the entire fish is cooked in stew, which then liberates the strontium-90 to then go into uh, them and their kids and, and, and future generations. The difference between cesium and strontium is that cesium is a muscle seeker. It goes to heart muscle, it goes to your body's muscles, and uh, that's why you find it in the meat of a fish, which is muscle. Strontium, on the other hand, is a bone seeker, and it goes to your body's bones, your body's teeth, um, especially in rapidly developing infants. That, that you know, Obviously, your bones are requiring lots of uh, calcium. Strontium is identical to calcium, so that they get um, it gets absorbed in the bones and is uh, likely to cause um, leukemia. Uh, so it's the uh, when you see the presence of strontium, um, it's a leukemia uh, precursor. And uh, you know, 20 or 30 years from now, we're going to see an increase in leukemia as a result of the strontium that plant release. And what might cesium be related to? Well, cesium will cause other cancers, um, not leukemia, what they call hard tumor uh, cancers are caused by, by cesium. The reason strontium is so hard to detect is because the, the, the ray it emits is it's, it's quite um, hard to detect. So what chemically has to be done is they have to separate out this, the, the bone, and then within the bone they have to separate out the calcium and put it in a detector and look for another isotope called yttrium. Strontium decays to yttrium, which uh, is, is pretty easy to detect. But that whole process takes as long as a month to chemically do the separation and put it in the detector. So you'll hear scientists talk about cesium as if it were the only thing. But in fact, um, it's pretty obvious to me that when you see 11,000 disintegrations per second in um, in fish, you're also going to see strontium in their bones. So easier to detect cesium. Arnie, what should the Japanese be doing about this right now? Right now, there has to be health warnings out to people who about eating freshwater fish. You know, people that just have uh, as an avocation, uh, you know, fishing in Fukushima Prefecture uh, are very likely to be catching fish that are highly contaminated. People that um, that need to feed their families by by uh, catching fish um, are very likely to be contaminating their families. Now, what the Japanese is, are are doing is watching these fish as they go to market, uh, but not all of them, and and so it's a it's a random sample. And um, 
but I don't believe that the health warnings the Japanese government has put out are adequate considering the numbers we're seeing. You know, well, it's not just the trout. It's, we, we've seen it in, in bass and we've seen it in, uh, in catfish um, as well. And not just in Fukushima, but in surrounding prefectures. So the problem is, um, is large uh, in, in area. And the concentrations are not inconsequential. You know, the Japanese government's position here is that uh, don't worry, be happy, um, uh, it's not going to hurt you. And in fact, over time, it is going to hurt a significant number of Japanese. And um, the government's got to step up here and admit that uh, this is a serious health risk. Right. For those of our listeners who are interested in reading that Japan Times article, you can find it under this podcast on the fairwinds.org webpage. Um, moving on, but sticking with the topic of contamination, uh, a few months ago you had taken soil samples in Tokyo and you found high levels of radiation in the Tokyo soil samples. But now some new information that may, may new data, I should say, that may confirm the samples that you took back then. Yeah, our readers may remember when I came back from uh, from Tokyo back in February, I had uh, five samples of, of dirt that I had taken just randomly uh, um, around the city. And um, they were all over 7,000 disintegrations per second in, uh, in a, a two-pound bag. Um, so what that told me was that the releases from the accident were um, were really severe, uh, even as far away as Tokyo. And I said then that if this were contaminated ground at a nuclear power plant, it would have to be considered as nuclear waste. Well, we took a lot of flack for that on the Thurwin site, but uh, we were right on the mark. What just happened um, just, just last week was that uh, in a suburb of Tokyo, uh, another sample was taken by citizens, and they brought it to the attention of the government that then sampled it. Um, but basically, they had a hot spot that was in excess of 10,000 disintegrations per second per kilogram of their sample. So here we are nine months after I took my samples, and citizens are still finding hot spots all over the Tokyo area. I think it speaks to, uh, one, the magnitude of the initial release. This was a a serious release, not just for Fukushima Prefecture, but for Tokyo and its suburbs as well. Tokyo is 130 miles away. This is not uh, around the corner. These high concentrations detected in Japan really speak to emergency planning elsewhere. I mean, Tokyo is 130 miles away from uh, Fukushima, and here's New York City, 26 miles away from Indian Point. Or you know, L.A. is 50 miles away from the, uh, the San Onofre reactors. So if Tokyo could be highly contaminated to the point where its soil should be shipped to a nuclear waste dump, what should the United States be doing when we've got nuclear plants that are much closer than, than Tokyo was to Fukushima? The, Tokyo from, to Fukushima is 130 miles, and here L.A. is 50 miles from San Onofre, and New York City is, a, is 26 miles away from Indian Point. If Tokyo can have soil so hot that it should be shipped to a radioactive dump, what might happen to our nation's capital, the biggest city in the United States, or to L.A. in the event of a nuclear accident? We're really not prepared, and we'll, we have our policymakers at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission have not even envisioned that as a possibility. All interesting information, Arnie. I want to also remind our listeners that this Wednesday we'll be publishing a special edition podcast to talk about issues happening within the United States. Arnie, could you just give us a little preview of Wednesday? There's a lot going on in the United States that would make this podcast way too long. Um, there's uh, issues um, related to losing the ability to cool the nuclear reactor in the event of an accident. Uh, we call that loss of an ultimate heat sink. Um, there's been containment damage detected at a couple of nuclear reactors now. Uh, the, the biggest problem on the horizon is cost. Uh, several nuclear reactors now have announced that they are considering permanently shutting down because the cost to keep them running is, um, is just too high. Uh, 
So we'll address all of that over Thanksgiving turkey at uh, the in the middle of the week.